going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit tonight. I want to start by telling you about some gifts that are in our home. And they are on the top shelf of some bookcases in our basement. They are wrapped in Christmas paper. There's two or three of them. And they were um, wrapped probably eight years ago, eight, nine years ago. And they never were received by the people that they were intended for um, through some rather sad course of events. But those gifts are sitting there, and my son and I were working in the basement a few, couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago. And he looked up and he said, what are those, Mom? What are those gifts up there? And I hadn't thought about them for a long time. And to be real honest, I couldn't tell him what was even in the packages anymore because it had been so long ago. And they're just sitting there on that top shelf collecting dust, wrapped in pretty paper, never received, and now we don't even know what they are. And as we go through this lesson tonight, I want you to um, understand that from God's perspective, the gifts of the Spirit within his church are a little bit like those gifts in my basement. They're sitting unwrapped, collecting dust, and most of the church doesn't even know what's in the gift or the gifts that he has for them. So it's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it, that God has prepared something for his people and we have not received it. So let's take this tonight and take it to heart. Let's pursue it. Um, when you start talking about gifts of the Spirit, you get into the supernatural. And some people will scoff. Some people will think we're crazy religious nuts. Okay? You know, we're just the weirdos that need a crutch, right? That's what I used to think about Christians. Okay? I wasn't a Christian all my life. Called myself one, but I wasn't. And when those people got really religious and they went to church every Sunday and they worshipped and stuff, you know, I thought, well, they, they just have something wrong in their life and they need, need that crutch. And that wasn't me, so I didn't go. Um, and I didn't come to guard God through hard knocks. You know, I, my life was pretty in order when I, when I did finally come to him and hear that call. But I, like everybody else in this world, and everyone who has come before us, had that empty place that only he could fill. And he keeps calling, and he keeps calling, and he hopes that we hear one day. So let's talk about the gifts that he has for us. What are they? Who are they for? And I'm going to add another W, the why. Why does he have gifts for his church? What will the gifts do? What will they accomplish in the world. And the first thing I want to say before we talk about those gifts is the commitments that we need to make if we want to understand the gifts and if we want to operate in the gifts. Okay. First of all, it seems very basic, but you have to believe the Word of God. Do you really believe that the seas parted, that the lame walked, that the deaf could hear and the blind could see? Do you believe that, or is it a nice fairy tale? And I'm sorry, but a lot of the church doesn't believe that anymore. Now, I am just um, crazy enough, silly enough, whatever you want to call it, but when I came to God, when I finally did, when I finally got the cotton out of my ears, out of the ears of my heart and heard him, I believed what I read. I accepted it. To me, it's kind of all or nothing. You know, if you're going to believe God, then I want to believe everything he said he did and will do. Okay, not just past, but will do. So let's commit to believing his word. And if it said, says there are gifts for us, let's learn about them and let's receive them. Let's open the packages. You know how little kids open Christmas presents? Man, they just go for it. They're ripping. They don't even get all the way open before they start on the next one. You know, the fun is in the ripping open the paper and the noise it's making and the pretty colors. So let's be like that with the Word of God. Let's receive. Let's open it with gusto. 
Let's read the word. Okay, We've got to get into it once in a while to know what it has to say. Let's pray it. Like we talked about the last time I, I spoke was on prayer. Let's pray those scriptures and bring them to pass in our lives. Oh, here's a word. Let's submit to his authority in our lives. The gifts are going to come in part through our submission. Okay? Some of the things that we'll talk about tonight are a little different. You have to submit yourself in, to God in order for those things to flow. Okay? And finally, let's seek the gifts. The gifts that are sitting in my basement, basement I wish that the people they were intended for would seek those gifts. They are gifts that we would like to give. And it is sad that they're still sitting there. Romans 4, 8. When he, meaning Jesus, ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, a lot of times when we hear that scripture, we kind of stop with the he led captivity captive and we worship and say, yay, you know, we've been set free. But we, we miss the tail end of that scripture. It says he gave gifts to men. He has something for us. He has something um, supernatural for us. He has something that he wants to give us. That should excite us. And this world doesn't have a lot to offer, does it? There are some pretty sights to see. Um, you'll meet a few nice people in your lives. You'll pass through many relationships and acquaintances and not ever really take anything away from them. And then you'll have some that are really hard and maybe even damaging to you. Okay? What God has to offer is pure and holy. So let's look for the gifts. Now here's a caution before we go further. Um, these gifts are not things that can be taught. We're going to talk about some things like speaking in tongues, tongues and interpretation. Um, I've known places where they try and teach that. You can't teach that in Sunday school, okay? <laughs> it's not like French or German or Spanish or anything like that. You don't get out your textbook and learn it, okay? These are supernatural th things that come through our relationship with Jesus Christ. The word gift comes from the Greek word charis. Probably a lot of words you can think of that have that as its root. Um, but charis means grace or free or undeserved blessings. Okay? It's where we get the word charity. Okay? Where the word charismatic comes from. Okay? That's why churches that embrace the gifts are often called charismatic churches because they're based on that, um, that concept of the gift. What are they and who are they for? And why did he give them? Now, the really simple answer, I found one scripture that basically answers it. So I'm done in a minute. <laughs> okay? Not really. I have a lot more notes. But here's the answer. It's in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That covers what, who, for, and why. What are the gifts? Manifestation of the Spirit with a capital S. Okay? When the gifts are in, the op in operation, God is moving. Okay? What did we just experience? God spoke to his people through the gifts of tongues and interpretation. Okay? Who are they for? Did you catch that in this passage? Every man. Okay? And that's man as in humankind, men, women, okay? It's for every one of us if we will receive it. Okay? And why? To profit with all. To help. To help the church along its way, okay? To profit it. To give it something wonderful. When you think of the word profit, what do you think of? Something over and above the necessary? If you operate a business, the profit is what you take home. Overhead is what gets left behind, okay? It takes care of the business, doing the business, but the profit is that extra, that something extra. 
So God has given us manifestation of his spirit to all people to make the church something over and above what it is in its natural state. Okay? Now, verse 31, these are Paul's words, and there are a few that I wanted to draw attention to before we read that full chapter in Corinthians. Verse 31, Paul tells us something about the, the gifts that... Um, Old Testament, we heard this word in a kind of a negative connotation. Paul says to covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Now, coveting, a lot of times we don't think that's a really good thing to do, do we? We're told not to covet, covet our neighbor's possessions and things. But here Paul is saying covet earnestly the best gifts. And I think he chose the word intentionally. Covet means you desire something. You have a hunger for it. You want it. You're thinking about it. Okay? And and Paul is telling us to covet. And he didn't use just that word. He used earnestly with it. Covet earnestly the best gifts. So these are not things that God said, well, just kind of, you know, think about it if you like it. Pick it up if you don't. No big deal. He said, covet it, desire these things from me. What did we hear tonight? Desire, desire, desire. He is trying to tell us something, folks. He wants this to be a part of the function of his church. It will help us. It will profit with all. Okay? The end of that statement, Paul says, yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And that's the last verse of chapter 12. Well, chapter 13 goes into a big discussion of love. So as we're thinking of and learning about the gifts tonight, one of the things that we need to recognize is that they should be exercised in love. Okay? That is the best way for the gifts to function. God is love. His spirit will operate in love. Sometimes our human spirit can get mixed in, and we don't always do everything in love, do we? Sometimes we, we have some difficulties internally. All right, let's look at our foundational scriptures for tonight. The first one is 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 31. Long passage, but we need to read it. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Okay, so right out of the chute, he's saying, You need to not be ignorant of these things. You need to learn. Be learned in the study of the gifts. You know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calls Jesus accursed. And no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost gives us revelation of who Jesus is. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. So true spiritual gifts all come from one source, spirit with a capital S. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Here's where we're starting to get a list of some of our gifts. A word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirit, spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now notice all the way through there, it's to another, to another, to another. Okay, Lots of gifts for lots of people. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Where, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, 
and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now it hath but now hath God set the members of every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. Okay, Let's pause here for just a minute. One body, many gifts, and we need all of the gifts. Bottom line is what he's saying. We need them all. We need all members of the body. There is no one member that's greater than the other member. Okay. If you were only an eye, you wouldn't be able to hear. Okay? If you want to think, think it through in a little bit of a silly way, just picture your body as only an eye. It wouldn't function the way you're used to functioning. And so it is with the body of Christ. We need all of the gifts. Okay? We need them, need them all to be functioning. And God will give the gifts as it pleases him. Don't get on a power trip when we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit because God will dole them out as he sees fit. Okay. But do covet them, okay? So there's a balance here. And if they were all one member, where were the body? And now there are many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, say, nay. Much more, those members of the body which seem the more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given the more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body. Schism means no tearing apart, okay? God doesn't want his body torn apart. He wants it held together and healthy. But that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you know something right there. Look at the church in America today. And I know this tape will go out to um, many countries. But the church in America has become rather feeble. And I believe God wants to change that. And I believe we will be a part of the change when we receive these things into our heart and we begin to operate like the body that he wants us to be. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church. Here's another list coming up. Some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? So there's a big long stream of questions. You may not have all of the gifts, that's what Paul is saying. You know, we will all be divided out and be good at the things God wants us to be good at. And we will complement one another beautifully if we will allow it. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way, that way of love in the next chapter. Romans 12, 6 through 8, another foundational scripture for studying the gifts of the Spirit. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So we see several gifts gifts listed here, um, prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving. It's 
Sometimes we don't think of giving as a gift, but it is in the Bible. Ruling, showing mercy. Okay? It is a gift to be able to show mercy. Right? One more. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Fivefold ministry. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teacher, teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There's a lot of meat in that scripture, and we're going to pick parts of it out here and talk about it. Um, one of the things I want to point out is where it says, henceforth be no more children. Okay, Part of what we're doing tonight, part of what we're doing with this series is helping to grow people in their discipleship, helping them to truly understand what being a disciple of Christ is, we will grow up in that process if we will take these teachings to heart. And if we take these teachings to heart, then we're not going to be tossed to and fro. Okay, They're not going to be able to deceive us with doctrine that isn't biblically sound. Men with cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive us. We've met people like that, haven't we? People with enticing words that want to draw us away from our faith. Oh, you don't need that. We do need it. We need God. We need truth, not man's version of God sometimes. So why does, the God, why does God give us the gifts of the Spirit? In that last passage we read, we saw a lot of reasons why he gives us the passage or gives us the gifts of the Spirit. First one is to profit with all. We talked about that a little bit already. Perfecting of the saints. These are just some phrases from out of those scriptures. To grow up into him in all things. Who's the him that that scripture is talking about? Jesus Christ. These gifts will help us to become more like Christ. They'll give us understanding that we need to grow and to mature spiritually. To increase the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Okay. To grow the body by helping it to learn and to grow and be more like what his body should be like. Edifying, edifice, that was a word I loved when I was young and writing in school. I love to use the word edifice. Well, it means to build up. And I was writing about building buildings, but I thought, whoa, what a cool word to use, edify, or the edifice, you know, the building was wonderful. Well, God wants to build up his church and make it amazing in the earth. Make it something that draws men to it, okay? Because they see something different in the body of Christ and what they see in the world around them. Okay? The gifts of the Spirit will help that to happen. How about to testify? The gifts are used to testify of his work among us. And here's where it gets kind of sad again. If the church is missing and lacking a lot of these gifts, it's not testifying very powerfully of his work in the world, is it? If you look at the newspapers and television these days and you have any compassion in your soul, it is heartbreaking to see the state of mankind. What we think is right, the way to treat one another. Cliff and I were in Florida last weekend flipping through the television 
and people screaming at each other on reality shows, and you're just looking at like, I can't believe they're getting on national television watching that, or acting that way. And then people in other countries, this is what they think of us. <laughs> it's horrifying, okay? All right, I gotta keep moving. I could get on a soapbox here. <laughs> Hebrews 2, one through three. This speaks to testifying of God's work among us. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoke by an angel was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The gifts are part of our salvation. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit again which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with sign and wonders and with, the, with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Okay? So these gifts will also testify of the power of God if the gifts are active. And let's look at the gifts now. We have a long list to go through very quickly. From the scriptures, we find the following gifts, okay? And I've divided them into some categories. The service gifts we read in Romans 12, prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, and showing mercy. And I'll go through these in more detail in a minute, so don't panic that this is it for the teaching, okay? The ministerial office gifts, fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and then there's three categories of supernatural gifts that we've read about in 1 Corinthians. First category is things that we'll know, revelation that God will give. He will give that to us through a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, or discerning of spirits. Things that we will speak, okay? utterance, things that will come out of our mouths. Diverse kinds of tongues, interpretations of tongues, and prophecy. And then the ways that we will act, the power gifts, if you want to call them that, okay? Faith, the gift of healing, working of miracles. So let's look at the service gifts first. And what, who are we serving when the gifts are operating? You're mumbling. I can't hear anything direct. <laughs> Well, I'm going to say we're serving, serving two things, two people, two beings. How's that? We're serving God, first of all. Okay. But we're serving his body. Right? When we're ministering, we're serving um, other parts of the body of Christ. We're helping one another. So homework assignment, read Romans 12, 1 through 21. And I'm going to look particularly at Romans 12, 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, we read through this earlier, according to the proportion of faith or ministry, let us wait on ministering or he that teacheth on teaching, exhorting, giving, ruling, and showing mercy. Let's break those down a little bit more. What is prophecy? Prophecy is speaking discourse that comes from divine inspiration, okay? Um, someone is speaking as God inspires them and they allow the words to flow. It can be either forth telling or foretelling. What's the distinction? Um, forth telling is speaking forth as you're inspired. Foretelling is telling the future, future events, prophesying, and that's kind of where we tend to think of prophecy most of the time, but we need to remember it's also the other. If you've ministered like this, if you've taught in front of a congregation, um, if you've taught or sung, worshiping, dancing, you will know when that anointing happens and something comes forth that you didn't plan, okay? But it's by God's design. He's giving you the words or the song or a scripture or something to give out to his body. Ministry, service, okay? Most of us in here are ministers. You know what that involves. You're giving of yourself, you're pouring into other lives to help heal, grow, 
change people. Teaching. Um, instruction. You know, you go to school as a child to learn certain things. Well, we go to school as Christians when we come and we gather together and we teach one another and we learn the precepts of God and we build them one upon another, okay, and build ourselves up spiritually. Exhortation, calling near, summons, exhortation, admonition, encouragement, or comfort. You know, sometimes something comes in an inspired moment and it comes out a little differently. You, you can exhort on the moment you are um, either admonishing someone or encouraging them, and it's God-driven. Okay. Giving. God loves a cheerful giver. And sometimes we have a hard time with that, don't we? We have. I wish he was here. We have a great testimony to this in our in our church and involved in our lives. We see him all the time downtown at the office. Um, Tiny, Tiny is six foot eight. <laughs> so, you know. That word doesn't have any particular meaning with him, <laughs> but um, he has he gives of himself, and he's had quite a testimony, and he has learned that if he gives as God directs, he's receiving blessings, and and he's excited about it. You know, he was in my office on Friday just telling me about, you know, how he was doing some things and he was giving out, and it's exciting to watch somebody do that cheerfully. It's inspiring, okay? That is a man gifted in giving. Showing mercy. It is definitely a gift to be merciful. And church, we are going to need to be merciful. If we're going to reach the generations that are out there now, there's some ugly stuff out there to deal with. And if we judge them, we'll kill the body of Christ. Okay, so let us all be gifted in showing mercy. And leading, the word in King James is often translated as ruling, which has kind of a negative connotation to it. But doesn't God lift up leaders to go forward? And people, some people like to be led. They don't want to be leaders. Okay, so let us do it graciously and with mercy and love. The ministerial office gifts, um, I listed those, I read the scripture, but we have a teaching coming up on that on March 9th, so I'm not going to go into those gifts. Um, we know them, fivefold ministry gifts, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, okay? Let's get to the supernatural spiritual gifts. Now, here is where um, we're going to lose some people, okay? And I don't know if you're if we're going to lose any of you in this room, I hope not. Um, but maybe some people watching this in the future will say, oh, you know, here's where Christianity gets a little weird, a lot of do 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 <laughs> um, Why is it okay for a lot of other supernatural things in the world, but not as it relates to Christianity? That just boggles my mind, okay? We believe all kinds of crazy things out there in the world, but we don't want to let God be God. Now, if he is who he says he is, and I believe he is, I believe you believe he is, he created everything. You know, he spoke, and there's a stars and universe and a galaxy and uh, planets and waters and plants and animals. Look at his creative powers, okay? Is that not supernatural? I think it is. <laughs> I think it's amazing. I'm glad he did it, and I didn't have to think of all this stuff, okay? So he is supernatural by definition. It is not unexpected that supernatural things would happen when we're following him. So all the gifts come by operation of the Holy Spirit, Therefore, there's some things we need to remember as we talk about these supernatural gifts. First of all, salvation is a key element to the operation of the gifts. If you are not in relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have not experienced his supernatural saving of your soul, you will have a hard time understanding these gifts and you will have a hard time operating in these gifts. You need his Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you 
so that he can act through you. Okay? So if you're watching this tape, if you're having troubles understanding, I would encourage you to begin pursuing the salvation of your soul. Consider who you are, why you are, and who is it that wants to make sure you have an eternity. Okay? Do you know Jesus intimately? The more intimate we get to know him, the more supernatural things begin to take place in our life. What is a supernatural experience? It's just something that can't be explained by natural laws. Okay? No gravity, no physics, something supernatural. Happened outside the realm of the natural. Satan will try and imitate God, will he not? So as we talk about supernatural gifts, we need to always try the spirits behind the activities that we see taking place. 1 John 4, 1 through 5. Beloved, believe not every spirit, spirit, but try, or test, is what that word try means, the spirits. Whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Okay, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the spirit is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. If there are supernatural things taking place and yet Jesus is being denied, this scripture says that's the spirit of Antichrist at work in the world. And it is happening. And we will probably encounter that if we pursue this as we are. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now it's already in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So what's the first category of the spirit, spiritual gifts, the supernatural spiritual gifts? First category is things that we'll know. These are revelation gifts. A word of wisdom. Okay? That was listed in our passage that we read. What is it? It's divinely given understanding. Somehow, um, God communicates an understanding to you of a fact, a situation, an event, and you have no way of knowing that. Okay? You had no way to have that insight or that good judgment, that guidance for a particular need or a situation. Understanding, wisdom is understanding what to do with that knowledge also. God has given you something Wisdom dictates how you handle it, okay? Um, I want to use a few examples, some from Scripture, some from personal life, okay? Cliff and I have pursued the spiritual gifts in our life. We have believed when things happened that it was God directing them so long as it didn't oppose Scripture. Uh, one word of wisdom and combined with some knowledge, which we'll talk about next, um, when my oldest son was graduating, you know how the kids have a sneak day and they're going to go do something? And we, he had talked to us about what his plans were, and we had okayed them. And in the night, God woke Cliff up and said, no, there's something that could happen in this. He didn't say what it was, um, but just this was not a good thing to let the kids do. And they weren't doing anything that was you know, illegal, <laughs> illicit, et cetera. So we talked to them first thing in the morning and said, you know, we really don't, don't feel comfortable with this. We'll make provision for you to do something else. Don't know what could have happened. Very thankful that they listened and very much believe that was God intervening with a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge to stop something that could have happened. Okay? Here's an example from Scripture, Acts 27, 9 through 10. Um, I'm not going to read that, but Paul is going on a trip. Remember the story? They're sailing, and God gives Paul understanding that the trip is going to be dangerous. Paul tells shipmates, they ignore it. What happens? Shipwreck, okay? Didn't listen, the ship and the cargo was lost. Fortunately, as the story goes, life was not lost. What's the purpose of this gift? It's to protect us. 
God can see what we can't. And he can give us a word if we'll listen and then follow. He'll protect us from things, okay? He might be giving us a word of wisdom to admonish or correct us too, okay? We can probably all think of a few examples of that. Word of knowledge, what is it? Facts from God about people, things, events, or places that you could not have known. Have you ever had God give you some knowledge about someone and then maybe give you some direction about what to do with that knowledge? To pray for them, maybe to go to them and correct them. Okay. Another example from our, our lives, um, this is somebody we didn't know missionary that had come around to our office looking for um, contributions to his missionary work. And Cliff gave him some money, I believe, on the first trip. And then he came back and was telling us what he had done and from his second trip. trip and Cliff re or God revealed to Cliff that this missionary had been involved in some sexual sin while he was on the mission fields. And it was hindering his ministry. Big surprise, right? <laughs> if you're sinning, you're going to have some difficulty with your missions. Um, now, Cliff was real uncomfortable with that, but God made it very clear he wanted him to speak to this man and correct him. Now, how often when we're involved in something like that do we um, think that we're hiding it from God? You know, nobody knows what I'm doing. Well, God always knows. And in certain situations, he will... He will reveal it to someone. He did. Cliff sat the man down and talked to him. He immediately repented, and his life was changed and made better. Okay? Biblical example, Ananias and Sapphira. Lying. Okay? Thinking nobody will know the difference anyway. Now, their consequences were pretty severe. They drop dead on the spot. Okay. So these are serious. These gifts are serious. God will use them to shape and mold his church. Discerning of spirits. Okay. The last revelation, revelation gift. What is it? Um, divinely inspired knowledge of whether the spirit of a person is of God or not. Have you run across people that just made your skin crawl? You're probably discerning something about them. Likewise, how is it when you meet somebody that your spirits are knit together almost instantly? Isn't that amazing? That's a discerning of the spirit, okay? I want to move forward because I see that red clock ticking back there. <laughs> Read Galatians 5, okay? Um, Galatians 5 talks about the spirit, the battle of the spirit and the flesh, okay? And it will give us some insight as to why we need to have discernment of the spirits because when we are being enticed by the wrong spirit, the works of the flesh are not very pretty, okay? Supernatural gifts in the second category, the things that we will speak, the utterance gifts, Okay, we talked about words a lot the last time I talked and how much power is behind our words. Okay. So the first one, diverse kinds of tongues. Okay, this is an utterance, talking in tongues. Now, I don't know what your experience with talking in tongues was the first time you encountered it, but the first time I ever heard anything about talking in tongues, I was told it was of the devil. Okay, so for many years, I was petrified to go anywhere near anything that had anything to do with talking in tongues because I didn't want any part of the devil. Now, the problem with that is I had not read the Bible. Okay, so I had no knowledge to base my actions on other than the words that someone else had given me. If you get into the Bible, you will discover that talking in tongues is totally biblical. Okay. Again, it can be imitated. Devils will talk. Okay? But there are biblical tongues. 
And this gift is distinguished from the initial sign of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you speak in other tongues as you're born again, that's one gift. The diverse kinds of tongues spoken about in Corinthians 12 is different from that. And what those gifts are, or, or this gift is, is speaking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit for personal edification or prayer. 1 Corinthians 14.2 says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God. Remember we talked about praying in the Spirit a few weeks ago? And you run out of words, and if you will let that Spirit come forth, you will find yourself praying in tongues. And you're speaking to God. That's what the Scripture says. Okay, Maybe you're praying the deep needs of your heart. Maybe you're praying for someone else. Maybe you're interceding. Okay, But you are speaking directly to God when that is happening. For no man understands him. Do you understand when you hear somebody speaking in tongues? Not unless you by chance are given the gift of interpretation of tongues and it's a message to be going forth to the church, which we've just experienced. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Romans 8.26, we read this verse when we talked about praying in the Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, what about speaking under the anointing for church edification? If you're sensitive to the Spirit and you've experienced that, which I know everyone in this room did tonight because we had tongues and interpretation, we had prophesying. There is usually a settling of the spirit, and everybody is sensitive to the fact that God is present and ready to do something, to speak forth something. A message will come forth in tongues. Usually it's louder than what else is going on, and other things settle. And then there's an interpretation. Sometimes that's given by the same person. Sometimes it's not. Now, those messages, if the body is sensitive, they will always complement the service that is taking place. They will be timely for what is occurring in that place right then. They will be a witness to a sermon. They will never be adverse to scriptures. Okay? If something is coming forth, forth that is adverse to scripture, then it needs to be stopped. That's where the discerning of spirits gift moves in. And I have heard a pastor stop something and say this is, the gifts are not in operation. Okay. I, fortunately, I haven't had to make that call myself, but I've heard it happen. And sometimes people, people just get a little overzealous, or sometimes there are spirits in church that aren't altogether holy. Okay. Interpretations of tongues. This is the second gift of utterance. What it is, it's simply an English interpretation of what was said, you know, through the gifts of tongue, the gift of tongues. Okay? God has something to say to his congregation, and he will use his people to say it. Purpose. You notice I'm hitting purpose on so many of these. We need to remember there's a purpose to these things. This is not magic, it's not for our entertainment. It is there's a purpose behind the gifts of the Spirit. It is to help us with our understanding. It's to help us grow. It's an affirmation. How nice is it when God affirms what we're doing? We're going to talk about the gift of faith in a minute. When God asks, asks you to step out in faith, isn't it nice when he meets you there and affirms what you're doing? I love that. I am very grateful for those affirming, affirming moments. Okay, now if you're doubtful, about what we're talking about, I want you to consider some of Paul's words. Not mine, not anybody in this room, but Paul. We all have great respect for Paul. Wrote a good part of the New Testament. Very godly man. In 1 Corinthians 14, 5, he says, I would that you all spake with tongues. Okay, he wants us all to do it. 1 Corinthians 14, 18, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. Okay, he said, I do this a lot. 1 Corinthians 14.39, forbid not 
to speak with tongues. Okay. Paul expected, experienced, and desired speaking in tongues. So it is very biblical. Prophecy, the third gift of utterance. Study 1 Corinthians 14, okay? What is prophecy? It's divinely inspired utterances, words coming out of your mouth that you didn't plan, okay? We come up here with notes. We're making notes available. But most of us that are teaching, there's things coming out that we didn't plan on saying. That's divinely inspired words. The the Greek verb... I'm not going to try and pronounce it, means to speak under inspiration. You're speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Prophecy is not spoken in tongues, necessarily. Okay. It is an utterance that comes forth in something you can understand, in a language you can understand. We're in America, we're speaking English. If you were in France, it would come forth in French. But it's something you can understand. God wants to say something. There's no mystery about it. He is speaking to his people. Again, prophecy will always be harmonious with the word of God and with doctrine that's established in the Bible. Okay. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says that he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. Here's our purposes. Edification and exhortation and comfort. The English verb prophesy has two meanings, forthtelling, speaking while you're preaching, witnessing, etc., and God moves on you to speak something. Have you been witnessing to somebody? And I don't know about you, but most of the time when I'm witnessing, I'm praying, oh God, you know, give me some words so I can reach this person's soul. Well, when he gives you those words and you see that look on their face and they go, that's just what I needed to hear. God gave you those, okay? You didn't have that wisdom inside you to know what would reach their heart. You're prophesying something into their life. Foretelling, many Old Testament examples of foretelling, messianic prophecies, end-time prophecies, okay? That's another type of prophecy is to tell the future, right? So all speech that's anointed by God is prophecy in general, but there is also the specific gift of prophecy, which is a prophetic utterance by a prophet speaking to the congregation. Purpose of the gift, again, edify, exhort, and comfort, okay? Teach us, warn us, comfort us, affirm. Examples of prophecy from the scripture, I chose one that is a um, somebody who only appears in two, two passages. Okay, now I chose this particularly because we started with who is the gift, who are these gifts for? They're for everybody, remember? Now, have most of you studied Agabus? Anybody even familiar with the name? You kind of read right over it in the scripture, but listen to these two passages in Acts eleven twenty seven through 29. It says, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus. So here's a prophet that we don't read about much in the Bible. And signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth, which is famine, throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Okay. So speaking forth under the divine inspiration, he uttered a prophecy. There would be famine, and they were able to act on that prophecy and provide for brothers and sisters. Okay. Lays it out very clearly how prophecy can work and what it does for the body of Christ. The next day they were that were at that they were of Paul's company departed and they came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Ladies, this is for you too. Okay. Sometimes the church teaches that these things aren't for women, but they are for women if you read the Bible. 
And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he came to us, listen to this, he prophesied to Paul. He took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Forth telling of what would happen to Paul in days to come. Okay. Supernatural gifts, the third category. We're getting close to being finished. Things we will do. Okay. We need to be an active body of Christ. We can't just sit back and enjoy our salvation and be comfortable till we die. There's an awful lot of Christians doing that. Okay, comfortable pew sitters. I don't think anybody in this room is a pew sitter or we wouldn't be here at the warehouse. Okay? These are the power gifts. Faith, healings, and miracles. Do these things get people's attention? Yes. They should draw attention to God and what he is doing in the world, what he can do in the world and will do if we will cooperate with him. They are demonstration, they are for the demonstration of the power of the God, not the person. And that's important for us to remember. Sometimes we like to get the big head and we get in our own way. Okay, so as we pursue the gifts, we need to remember to be humble. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Okay, I repeated that for a reason. God doesn't want us ignorant of these things. So let's believe them. Let's take them to heart. And let's activate them. 1 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. Here's where these three gifts are mentioned. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. The gift of faith. Now, we all know that faith is essential to our Christian walk. We had a certain element of faith to even be saved in the first place, right? You made a conscious decision to believe in God, to believe his word, to pursue salvation. The gift of faith goes beyond that. It's, it's a, well, there's a word I'm looking for, and it's not coming to mind. I hate that. And it's going to drive me nuts till I think of it. Transcends. That's it. <laughs> the gift of faith transcends saving faith. Okay? This is the kind of faith that allows a person to act in a way that they normally would not have the confidence to act because God has spoken something to them and they can believe it will come to pass. Okay? Paul wrote in Romans 1, 16 through 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, has faith, to the Jew first and all to the Greek, also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is. That's where we started this lesson, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What is this gift of faith? It's supernatural. Okay, The purposes are to demonstrate, to encourage believers, to inspire faith in others. Okay, If you were with Moses the day the sea parted, would it have inspired you? I would like to see that tape replayed when I get to the other side. But that had to be amazing, okay? Your faith would soar in those moments. Now, sadly, they got to the other side, and their faith kind of went fizzled. Hopefully, we could have held on to that for a minute, enjoyed and enjoyed what God revealed to us, his power. Remember, these are the power gifts. Moses had the faith to hold the rod out and let God do the rest. And that's probably the real thing that defines supernatural gift of faith. Let God do the rest. You do what he asks you to do, and let him do what only he can do from that point forward. Okay? Examples of supernatural faith. 
I won't read it, but I want you to read Acts 6 and 7 that talks about Stephen. It's the end of his life. Okay. Now, he was about to be stoned to death. I would be shaking in my boots, I think, if I were about to be stoned to death. It sounds like it would be painful, a miserable experience. Instead, he recites the history of Israel, looks to God and looks like an angel, and as he's dying, as he's going to sleep, it says, he asks that God would not give, you know, put this sin on their account. Okay? That's supernatural faith. Okay? Gifts of healings. When we think of healings, I want us to think of two types of healings. We tend to focus on the physical healing. Isn't, super, isn't our spiritual healing every bit as amazing? Yeah, more amazing. When you watch somebody changed after their encounter with the God of all creation and you see their life begin to blossom, that's healing. Okay? Let's talk about physical healings for a minute, though, because God used those throughout the Bible to testify to his power. Okay? Blind could see, lame could walk. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, his authority. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Okay, here's some of the gifts that we're talking about. Take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly things, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. One last example from our own lives. You all know what an electric burner looks like on a stovetop, right? Right? And when it gets hot, it's red and glowing and looks kind of terrifying. In my wisdom, one day I laid my hand on that. I still don't know why I did that. But it burned. Not, not that hand, this hand. It burned three fingers, white rings, into my hand. Cliff saw it so he can testify to the truth of this. I looked at it, and I had people coming for dinner. I didn't have time to go to the emergency room or deal with it. So I prayed. I laid hands on myself and I prayed. And I believed that God would heal me. And by the end of that day, you could not tell that had happened. Okay. Does he heal? I am an absolute believer. I saw it go away from my hands within the course of just a few hours. Okay. That is God. That is what he can do that we cannot. Okay? All right. Last gift. Gift of miracles. Working of miracles related to everything we've talked about. What's the difference between the working of miracles, working of miracles and some of the other gifts? It's an instantaneous act. Sometimes spiritual healing, sometimes physical healing takes place over time. But working of miracles happens instantaneously. Here's a list, okay? Acts 3.18, healing of a lame man. The rolling back of the sea in the Old Testament. That's a miracle, okay? In anybody's book. Moses, the rod, the Egyptians. The feeding of 5,000, okay? In our natural state, when our pantry has only a little in it, it only goes so far. Not in that case. Walking on the water by Jesus and Peter. That's a miracle. We were at the Sea of Galilee in November, and I did not take a walk across that sea. <laughs> okay? I thought about it. <laughs> I thought, do I have the faith to step out there <laughs> and see what happens? And I didn't try. Raising the dead. In the Bible, dead people got up and lived again. And we started this by saying we believed what the Bible had to say. Are these gifts for this church today or not? Yes, they are. There is no place in the scripture that it says those things are not for us today. Can you pick a place? Can you show me any place where it says that? Why does the church act like it's not for us? Let us be a people that takes those gifts off the shelf and dusts them off and opens them up with the joy of a little child at Christmas and let's use them 
Let's let God be God. Man, I want to see what he can do in this earth in this day and age. I want it desperately. I've been waiting for years to see it. And you know what? What's happening with Church Beyond the Box is the first time I've believed it could happen. Because I can see now that there are other people that want these things. So stand up. Let's pray together.